Hey there, I'm Ari from the Tech Buyers Guru, and this is the first in a two-part series looking at how you can optimize the performance of your all-in-one liquid CPU cooler. For all my testing, I'll be using the new Castle 280EX from Deepcool. It was just released in July of 2020, and Deepcool was kind enough to pass along a sample, but take note, this is not a review in the traditional sense, as I will not be comparing the 280EX to any other coolers, at least not at this point. Instead, I'll be focusing on how you can optimize the performance of this cooler based on where you place it in the chassis and which fans you equip it with. Now, in this first video, I'll be focusing on the placement question. First, mounting it up front and blowing in, and then mounting it up top and exhausting out. I'll be looking at temperatures of various components in the chassis, not just the CPU, to see if we can strike a balance between very good CPU temps and very good overall temps in the system. In the second video in this series, I will be equipping this radiator with a number of aftermarket fans. Now, I have no doubt that the TF140S fans that it comes with are very good, so I will be including it in that video as well. But this fan will have a number of competitors, including the Noctua NFA14, the Noctua NFA12X25 using a 140 millimeter adapter, the Arctic P14, and the Scythe Kaza Flex 140. Now, if you've seen any of my previous fan roundups, none of these contenders should be new to you. The Arctic P14 and its smaller cousin, the P12, have been named runners-up in all of my shootouts. The Scythe Kazaflex 140 and its smaller cousin, the 120, have been named the number one case fans on the market. And the Nocto NF A12 X25 was named the number one radiator fan in the 120mm size class. But frankly, this competition is up for grabs, and I really don't know which one's going to come out ahead. Maybe it'll actually be the TF140S that comes stock on the Deepcool Castle 280EX. That all remains to be seen, and you will have to tune in to the second part of this video series to find out the winner. For now, let's focus on the radiator placement. I'll give you a closer look at my system and then show you how I installed the 280EX. The case I'm using for this test is one I've featured in a number of previous videos. It's the PureBase 500DX from Be Quiet. I've actually upgraded it here with some Arctic P14 fans. I have two in the front and one in the rear. I'll be using an AMD Ryzen 7 3700X 8-core 16-thread processor mounted on an Asus X470 board and paired with Viper DDR4 3600 RAM. And my GPU is an EVGA RTX 2080 Ti that will exhaust plenty of hot air into the system to truly challenge the cooling. Now let's get into the installation. Of course, I have two options, mounting it up top in the roof of this chassis or in the front of the system, which will require removing the case fans and moving them up to the top. Before I even get to that step though, I'll be installing the brackets on the cooling block and then attaching the cooling block to the motherboard. Let's take a look at how that all comes together. Here are the brackets that attach to the cooling block. They are universal and I'll show you how those work. You also have these thumb screws that act as standoffs and I'll show you how that works as well. And of course we have some cables. These are extension cables for your fans and there's also an extension cable allowing you to power and control your ARGB effects on the cooling block. Speaking of the cooling block, let's go ahead and get it set up with the brackets. First, I remove this protective plastic cover, revealing the pre-applied thermal paste. That is convenient, but does mean you want to make sure you don't mess up that application while you're installing the brackets because you don't have additional thermal paste. Now, we'll go ahead and install these. Note that these are actually identical for purposes of AM4. They look different, but the AM4 mounting holes actually line up, so it doesn't matter which one you put on which side of the cooling block. Now I'll go ahead and attach those brackets using the included short screws. It always helps to have a magnetic screwdriver if you do have one handy. Otherwise, you'll just need to have maybe three hands to get this done. Now, once I have these in place, I can go ahead and mount it to my motherboard. Note that you will be using the AMD backplate that comes with your motherboard. You'll be using these thumb screws to attach it. And note they do have a different size of thread. The thicker thread goes into that backplate. Don't be alarmed when you're done. If the backplate seems to float, that is part of the design of the deep cool cooler. Now I carefully lower the cooling block into position, remembering that there is thermal paste applied to the bottom of it. And then I use these other thumb screws with my screwdriver to attach it going diagonally from side to side to equalize the pressure. Now I'm gonna lower my radiator into position to see if I can actually take advantage of the case's 280 millimeter radiator mounting holes. Note that I'm definitely making impact with these cables, but I think I can make it work. I'm gonna mount the fans and see if I have sufficient clearance. Make sure that the fans are oriented in the proper direction. The frame side is always the exhaust side and I want that blowing out the top of my case. Using the eight long screws that are included with the cooler, I will attach the fans to the radiator. 
Here I'm attaching the second fan and we'll get ready to install it in the chassis. If you will be mounting the radiator to the top of the chassis, you have to make absolutely sure you attach all of the cables that will be blocked by the radiator. That includes the radiator's own power cables and fan cables. So make sure you have those connected as well, of course, as your CPU power cable that is right over here and totally blocked by the radiator. It looks like this is gonna fit, so I'm gonna go ahead and attach the ARGB control cable here to my motherboard, which luckily isn't blocked by the radiator's fans. And then I will attach the radiator to the top of the chassis. Once you've ensured that all of your cables are in place and not being pinched by the radiator, we can go ahead and attach it to the top of the case. There are eight small screws included with the radiator that are used for this purpose, and they're very easy to attach if your case is well designed like this Be Quiet model. At this point, I install the video card and get ready to turn this system on. There's really nothing better than a system that turns on with the first push of that power button. And I'm really liking the looks of the Castle 280EX from Deepcool. It has an infinite mirror effect to its cooling block. It's definitely the coolest ARGB effect I've seen on any cooler. And while it doesn't have ARGB effects on the fans, it's something I could add later on if I wanted. And frankly, for my personal systems, I typically go with a solid color like this. So while that installation went smoothly, now I'll show you how you install it up front. You pull the front cover off, revealing the case's fans, which of course will have to be moved to the top. Then I'm going to go ahead and install the radiator. It is a little bit simpler to mount it up here because you don't have cables to deal with. And you actually just use a single screw to go through the fan and then into the radiator itself. Once I've got all the screws affixed, I just spin the fan to make sure I have no obstructions and I'm ready to go. So everything is running and working according to plan. And it actually looks pretty good this way too. I have my Arctic fans at the top and in the rear, and of course those deep cool fans in the front. I'll put the fan filter back in place, reaffix the front cover, and then I'll be ready to go. All right, before we get into the benchmarks, I wanna talk about my methodology because I made a number of important decisions that I think separate my results from a lot of other reviewers out there and really add weight to my conclusions. Number one, I used three different tests, CPU-Z, Cinebench R20, and 3D Mark Firestrike combined to test different aspects of the cooler's performance. I did not test idle because I don't think that's a valid test for a CPU cooler. So many things will affect a CPU's temperature at idle that you really can't control. And I've had so many people come to me over the years and say, there's something wrong with your test or there's something wrong with my system. My idle temps are way off. It's just that you can't test idle temps on modern CPUs. There's too much going on in the background. So I will not provide idle temps. Number two, I changed the position of the radiator, but I also changed the RPMs. I ran it at max, which was about 1600 RPM, and then I also ran the radiator's fans at 800 RPM. You'll see some divergent results based on the RPM reading, and I think it's important to keep in mind that most people don't actually run their radiator's fans at maximum RPM. Now, I did think about doing decibel normalized testing as I do with my fan test, but I couldn't do it in this test because the source of noise, i.e. the radiator and its fans, was moving inside the chassis. So if I had a fixed microphone placement, it might favor the front or the top position. There was no way to make that normalized because the noise source isn't normalized. Now, third, I fixed the fan RPMs in my case and on my GPU. My case fans were fixed at 700 RPM, and my GPU fans ran at zero RPM when it wasn't under load and 60% when it was under load. I wanted all of those fixed so that they didn't change in response to changing temperatures and therefore skew the results. Now, the fourth factor here is the most important, and it's where I really diverge from a lot of other testers out there. I did not use Delta from Ambience. It's because it's completely invalid. I'm about to show you some benchmarks that I ran just to prove that the technique that so many other reviewers have used for years is simply out of expediency, not of, out of any scientific principles. So basically, the problem here is that when you use Delta from Ambience, it skews the results terribly whenever a component is well above the ambient temperature. That's particularly concerning for CPUs and GPUs that run, say, 30, 40 degrees above the ambient temperature. So let's take a look at the results that I have preliminarily to show you why you can never trust any result that you see on the internet, on YouTube, or anywhere else that uses Delta from Ambience. All right, to demonstrate why presenting thermal benchmarks with a delta from ambient approach is mathematically invalid, I'm going to present some really simple data here. I ran a single test using CPU-Z twice, first at 21 degrees Celsius ambient and then at 24 degrees Celsius ambient. Nothing else changed between these two tests. The setting and the position 
of the radiator was exactly the same. Now look at the left side of this chart. You'll see that the CPU ran at 70 degrees in a 21 Celsius ambient and 71 degrees in a 24 Celsius ambient. Now if I presented this data using delta from ambience, look at how the results come out. This is actually the very same cooler performing exactly the same way, but what if it were a different brand? Now you'd have a skewed result. Note that the closer the component's temperature is to the ambient temperature, the more accurate using delta from ambience is. But the further you get away, the more wildly inaccurate it becomes. Now look, the reason that reviewers use delta from ambience is because it's convenient. The temperature in their testing room is changing over time. They can't stabilize it, so they just give you a delta from ambient. Furthermore, perhaps they want to load their charts with years worth of data, where of course the temperature isn't going to be the same. Frankly, it's just made up. It's not valid data and it doesn't tell you anything at all. And I'm sorry to have to bring you this news. It makes it a lot harder to do thermal testing. And that meant that in my testing, I actually had to wait until my room stabilized in temperature. If in the morning it was two degrees cooler, I wouldn't run the test. If in the afternoon it was much hotter, I stopped doing the test until the next morning. That's why this review took longer than perhaps other people reviewing the same topic. I really tried to put in the time to make these results as valid as possible. And without further ado, here are the benchmarks. On the left side, we have the 800 RPM test, and then on the right side, the 1650 RPM test. So starting with the 800 RPM results, we see that the CPU temps are identical, but actually some of the other temps are very different, particularly the chipset and VRM temps, which are quite a bit higher when you mount the radiator in front and have that hot air blowing into the system. Flipping over to the maximum RPM test, we actually see something that's even worse for the front mounted radiator. Not only is the CPU hotter, but the VRMs, the chipset, and the GPU are all hotter as well, particularly that VRM, which is very important. The one saving grace for the front mounted system is that it's a little bit quieter at maximum RPM, and that's probably because it's just not projecting the noise towards me where I had the microphone positioned. It's projecting it out away from me. Now, while CPU-Z is very representative of typical loads, including gaming, Cinebench R20 is an extreme load. Now, I just run it once. It's about one minute long on my 3700X, which is locked at 4.2 gigahertz. And here we see slightly different results, but overall, mostly the same news. Regardless of RPM, you're gonna be running a much hotter chipset and VRM if you have a front-mounted cooler, while your CPU is actually not gonna be any cooler at all. And another thing I want to point out is how close the results are based on RPM. You can cut your RPM in half and reduce your noise levels by about 15 decibels and have very similar results. At this point, you're probably wondering if there's any reason at all to front mount a radiator. And here is the graph that might convince you to do it, but I don't want you to put too much weight on this. Yes, the CPU is much, much cooler when you front mount it and have a gaming load. Here I'm using 3D Mark Fire Strike combined, which is loading up both my 2080 Ti GPU and the 3700X CPU. The reason this happens is simple, and it's not something that other reviewers who have recommended front mounting your radiator have told you. It's because the CPU is getting heat soaked by exhaust heat from the GPU. Now, yes, that is a real phenomenon. It is certainly heating up the CPU, but it's not because mounting a radiator up front actually is inherently better as I've shown in my other CPU specific benchmarks. And I want to make clear, that it's at the expense of GPU temps. So my GPU temps go up as my CPU temps go down, and I don't think that this is a good balance in your system when you're gaming. In fact, I'd make the argument that if you front mount, you have to run those fans at very high RPM to compensate for how much heat they're dumping on the GPU. All right, I think the data is pretty clear. If you want to impress your friends with the best CPU thermal benchmarks, go ahead and mount your radiator in front. If you want to get great system temps and get great gaming performance, mount it up top. Here's why. NVIDIA GeForce GPUs throttle at various points, 60, 70, 80, 84 degrees Celsius. As you pass each of those thresholds, you actually lose clock speed and therefore frame rates. CPUs don't behave the same way. They don't throttle at 60, 70, 80 degrees. Yes, if you hit 100 degrees, they will slow down. And yes, AMD's Precision Boost Overdrive does add a little bit of speed if it's running a little bit cooler. But if you really care about that, then just manually overclock like I did. On the other hand, your GPU is going to suffer if you have the radiator feeding it hot air all the time. You're almost guaranteed to lose clock speed if you have that radiator 
positioned right in front of your GPU. Now, that means just about for everyone, I recommend you mount it up top if you can. But in my upcoming video where I equip this cooler with some aftermarket fans, I'm actually gonna mount it up front. And I know some of you are gonna see that and say, what are you doing? Well, the reason I'm gonna be doing that is all I will care about when testing the fans is CPU temps. And as I've shown, CPU temps are best when mounted up front. Furthermore, I have a practical reason for doing this. It's much easier for me to switch out fans if the radiator is mounted in front, and it's much easier for me to give you audio samples if the fans are in front as opposed to buried up top inside of the chassis. So yes, in the next video in the series, you will see my radiator mounted up front, but I will give the disclaimer that I don't recommend that for anyone who can mount it up top. I also want to commend Be Quiet for designing a great mid-size ATX chassis that can actually fit a 280 millimeter all-in-one up top. I didn't think it could happen, but it did. Now, of course, I've said a few things that were pretty controversial in this video. If you have comments or questions, please post them down below. I'll do my best to respond. If you enjoyed the video, of course, I do appreciate a like and subscribe, and I will catch you next time.